Forage of House Antiques. Hi, George. Hi, Norm. Now, you specialize in whirly gigs down at the shop. Yes, we do. Whirly gigs and all kinds of toys and things that have movement. Well, why don't you show us what you have here at your house? Okay. Well, if we come into the gallery living room, uh, this was a whirly gig. The blade is gone. Uh -huh. It's all metal. And this one shows wow, a lot of men working on the railroad. Pump car here. We even have an Indian down here. That who, is great. And this one's activated with uh, the rod coming around mm -hmm. and hitting the the little sprockets on the other mm -hmm. side. That is great. Now here's one that seems to be a bit simpler. Oh, this one's very simple and served a different purpose. This was not a toy. This was actually a tool. Really? This is what would have been put into the ground to scare moles. The propeller would spin. The vibrations would come through down here with a spike into the ground, and the vibrations hopefully would keep those moles out of your lawn. Hmm, it's kind of unique. Now, how about this piece right here? Oh, That's a large piece. A wonderful toy, Norm. This was done in New York State probably around 1930, and it is a circus activated by a handle. Wow, you got the three ring circus, the ringmaster, and even the elephants. Who would have built things like this? Oh, probably a grandfather or a father, definitely for the children. Mm -hmm. They had lots of times on their hands. Yeah, it's, it's great. Definitely pre-television. Now, what about this one? This has several propellers on it. Oh, this is a complicated one, but still very simple, and probably from Nova Scotia. Three propellers, always to turn it into the wind, mm -hmm. and then the two men, which would all spin. Wow. Wind. Now, it's made out of... It looks like mostly scrap pieces of wood. It's very simple, and this is the original paint job? It's still the original paint, what's left. Hmm. How about this one over here? Well, this one, Norm, is probably shows the most common form of activity in whirly gigs. Somebody sawing wood. Let's see how this works. Well, the little propeller turns. Paint. There's a little bit of a crankshaft there that goes down to another stick of wood that comes along here to another metal rod, and the arms and the man move as the saw passes over the log. Wow, mm -hmm. that's great. Of course, these have to be carefully balanced so they always turn into the wind, right? right they would always had a rod that would have gone into a solid a post or a something, mm -hmm. so it would anchor it and let this part Swirl turn around. into the wind. We have it anchored right here for display. Mm -hmm. Now that's a, another wind-powered piece. How about some more mechanically powered pieces, like oh, hand-driven? We have several hand-driven things. Let's look at this piece here. By John Scholl, a uh, very famous American who carved a lot of fanciful toys. Mm -hmm. Eight acrobats. Mm -hmm. And it just around. runs on some pulleys and yeah. some strings. Pure fantasy. Why would have they built these? To uh, just keep, keep children busy during idle hours. Uh, so many toys were done, and so many things that had movement. I let the children do things. I mean, today we have pull toys and this, this was before just, televisions, that's for sure, right? You got it. They're great. Now, this one right behind your arm there looks very rustic. Oh, a rustic. very primitive one. No paint, all wood, uh, not highly finished, not sanded, not refined. Oh, this looks like part of an old soapbox. Yeah, it's the Dutch cleanser girl. Huh. And uh, this would help date it. I mean, we could go and look when the Dutch cleanser girl was on wooden soapboxes. And this is all made out of wood. The only metal that I see are actually the screws. Mm-hmm. A very simple, rustic mm. piece. Now, do you have any whirly gigs that were made here on Nantucket? Oh, that's what we specialize in. And the most common form of those whirly gigs made in Nantucket are the Dewey Boys, the Sailor Boys. Uh, these guys were made by a variety of makers, and the first ones were called Dewey Boys after uh, Admiral Dewey in the Spanish-American War mm -hmm. in 1898. And uh, this one is clearly marked Nantucket in the front, so we know it's from here. And on the back, it has Lincoln Seely Maker Nantucket Mass. Hmm. So this was a cottage industry down here. It was here. a cottage industry. Seely died in 1951, but these guys, this one probably dates from the 40s mm -hmm. when he was most active and had his family all involved in making these. Do you find examples of these sailor boys in other parts of the country? There were uh, many variations. The table has a whole group of them. This one, for example, we found this guy in Nashville. That's He's only a, a fragment, yeah. but definitely Nantucket. He has the bowed legs, mm -hmm. the feet, the same kind of hat, 
But how he was ever activated, I am not sure, That's because great. these arms do not move, right. which you find here. Now these three right here? All uh, either marked by Lincoln Seeley or I would attribute them to Lincoln Seeley. Let's see how they're made. Basically the body is just a three-quarter inch board and the hat is kind of interesting because the rim is a piece of metal, probably zinc because that's used frequently down here on the island as well as the ribbon is metal. And then once that was installed it was just capped off with this piece of wood. And the arms appear to be just dowels connected by a shaft and the paddles look to be just hand carved. Yeah, the paddles are, are replacements, it's, it, which we have to do. Mm -hmm. Now the shoes, uh, I understand they're either applied or sometimes carved out of the same piece of wood as mm -hmm. the body is. Now there's a bit of work that would go into one of these. What do you think they cost originally? Oh, probably three, four, five dollars. Hmm. How about today? Uh, different story. Today they're highly desirable, highly collectible here on the island. And the one you have in your hand is $1,600. Wow. Well, it's an amazing piece. And there's a lot of good ideas here about how whirly gigs work. I'll take some of them back to the workshop and see if I can come up with a version of my own. Well, I can't wait to see it, Norm. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. That trip to Nantucket was valuable. I learned a lot about whirly gigs. But when I got back here to the shop, I took a look at our old sign. For years, we've been trying to figure out a way to animate it, maybe make the saw blade turn. One thing led to another, and here's what we came up with. Our own whirly gig. Now, does the guy running the saw look familiar? Let me turn on a little wind and show you how it works. Once the propeller picks up the wind, it spins. Then it spins the saw blade, and the arm moves back and forth as if cutting a piece of wood. Now later, we'll paint it to match the new Yankee colors. Now, I want to get started today cutting out the larger parts of the whirly gig. For this project, I'm using mostly plywood, either half inch, MDO, which is an exterior grade plywood with a paper facing, which will be nice and smooth to paint later, or a multi-laminated quarter inch marine plywood, which will also hold up very well outdoors. I've used a full size poster board layout, traced it onto the plywood, and I'll cut it out at the bandsaw. But before we use any power tools, let's take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. A little bit of touch up with my drum sander. I don't want to refine it too much. It still should be a bit rustic. Once again, using my pattern, I'm using a scratch all to mark the location of the holes that will articulate the arm and for the saw blade shaft. And we'll drill those over at the drill press, which I've set up with a quarter inch brad point bit. Now I've switched the drill bit to a smaller one. I've clamped both sides of the whirly gig together. And I want to drill the hole for the saw shaft. The arm pivots on these posts and screws. They're made out of plastic. There's one at the elbow and one at the shoulder. I had to recess the head of the post for the shoulder on the back side of the body. And I've also recessed the connection at the elbow so the post won't rub against the body. To do that, I'm just using a 3 8 inch brad point bit. This piece of poplar will be sandwiched between the plywood sides. I need a groove down the center for the drive shaft. Two passes through the saw will take care of that. That slot is necessary for the pulley that will drive the saw. That hole is for the post, which will allow the whirly gig to spin into the wind. Now for a little assembly. I'm going to take the side with the figure and actually glue and nail that to the poplar block. 
Now on the other side, I want to be able to remove it for mechanical reasons. So I'll attach it with just screws. I need to make some pulleys. So here I'm using my plug cutter to produce some discs. Here I've switched to a smaller plug cutter for the center of the pulley. To assemble the pulleys, I made a little jig, a piece of three quarter inch plywood with half inch holes that go five eighths through and small holes that go all the way through. I'm using an epoxy glue for the assembly. I've got a quick setting version, sets in five minutes. It's waterproof and it's strong. So what I do is set one of the half inch pieces in the jig, put on a dot of glue, then set a 3 8 inch piece as close to the center as I can, push it down, put another little dab of glue on, and another half inch disc. And we'll set those aside to dry. Here I'm freehanding a saw blade with a band saw blade. That takes care of the hole in the saw for the shaft. Now I'll drill the holes through the pulleys while they're still in the form. Now I'm ready to start building some shafts. So I've taken off the saw table and you can see that the shaft runs through the pulley and some sleeves so that it can spin freely and nuts hold them in place. The material I'm using for the shaft is this 1 8 inch solid brass bar that I picked up at a hobby shop and the sleeve is just a hollow tube that slides over it easily. Now the rod comes without thread so I'm cutting my own using this. It's a die. They come in various sizes and various thread patterns. And the idea is to just carefully start it on the end and make about a quarter turn forward then back it off to remove the chips until I thread the right amount. See what a nice job it does? Now I'll cut it to length and thread the other end. Now the bandsaw blade cuts right through this soft brass like it's butter. Before I glue the saw and the pulley to the shaft, I'm taking a file and making a little bit of a flat spot It'll leave room for the epoxy and it'll keep it from slipping once it's set up. You can see that if I didn't file it off, there wouldn't be any room for that epoxy. Also on each end, I'm epoxying a small washer in place and that'll ride up against the tubing later. I've just cut a couple small pieces of the tubing, which will act as a spacer and a bushing. Now let's build the long shaft. First, I thread one end. If you look at the other end of the shaft on the prototype, you can see that I need to bend an offset and then thread the end. First, I mark the length and then I set on a pair of locking pliers. And I can simply bend it by eye to about 45 degrees, first in that direction, and then bend the other side parallel to the shaft. Here I've just soldered on a washer, which will act as a stop for the wire that controls the arm. Let me show you what I got on this shaft so far. I have one little sleeve, another sleeve, a washer, and then I've flattened out a spot where I'm going to glue this pulley and another washer. Well, now I'm ready to glue the shaft in the slot, putting a little bit of epoxy just where the bushings are going to go. I don't want to get any epoxy on the shaft itself. Now I used short pieces of sleeve 
because I felt that if I ran the sleeve the entire length of the shaft, that it would create too much friction. I'll put a little bit of epoxy on top, and then we'll let it set for a few minutes. Now I'm ready to install the shaft with the saw blade. I push the sleeve through the side that's already in place. Take this nut off and slip the other side on and position it. I want to slide the saw over so it's about an eighth of an inch from one side. And that seems to be spinning okay. Now I'll tack one of the sleeves so it can't move. Now just a touch of thread locker so those nuts can't come loose. These are covers for the main shaft. And that takes care of the top for the table saw. Before we button this up, I've run a piece of string under the lower pulley, over the top one. I'm going to tie a square knot to secure it. Now I'll just trim off the surplus. OK, let's see how it works. Pretty good. Now we can cover it up. The last thing I want to do is glue this little piece right under the table and glue it only to the side closest to the arm. That'll guide the lower arm. And we'll let it dry until morning. Well, good morning. I thought we'd get started today building the propeller for our whirly gig. Now, this is an earlier version that I rejected. And the reason that I rejected it is that the fan blades were not large enough to drive the mechanism. But the hub works great. If you look at it, you can see that the hub has slots cut at a 45 degree angle into which I glue the quarter inch plywood propeller blades. Now the hub starts out as a piece of three quarter inch thick material. I mark the diameter of the hub and the center point, And along each edge, I put the 45 degree layout for the fan blades. One way to cut the slots for the fan blades is to use a radial arm saw. So I've carefully set up a stop block against which I can put the blank, and I'll use a push stick to hold it in place. With the saw turned to 45 degree angles and the height set to go down about 3 eighths of an inch, I'll make one pass. That slot isn't quite wide enough to take the quarter inch plywood of the fan blades. To widen it, all I have to do is turn the piece around, put it up against the stop block again, and run all four edges. That takes care of making the hub round. And that takes care of the hole for the shaft. To make sure that all the fan blades are identical, I've stacked four pieces of quarter-inch plywood together, wrapped them with some masking tape so they won't move as I cut them out. Then I'll sand the edges smooth. This carpenter's glue should do the job holding the fan blades in the hub. It is a weatherproof version. Now, the important thing here is to keep the blade centered in the hub. The reveal here has to match the reveal on this side, and I want to make sure that it's thoroughly seated in the hub. While the propeller has been drying, I epoxied a post into the body and at the elbow connection. A couple of these plastic washers at the shoulder point, slip it on, and then put a screw in, which secures that part of the arm. Now, before I can put the lower arm on, I need to take a piece of wire and wrap it around the crankshaft. Now, to make that wrap, I found that if I just take a scrap piece of my brass rod and clamp the wire to it, I can bend it around. OK, let's see how that fits. 
That's good. Now the tricky part. I'm going to lay the wire over the post on the arm and check the bottom here. And there seems to be good freedom. It's not going to bind up. And I'll bend a loop in the other end. All right, let's give that a try. Just turn the crank. A little bit of binding there. We'll make a couple adjustments. Now I think we're ready for a test run. A washer, the wire, another washer, the arm, and finally the screw. Okay, that's working pretty good. Let's give it a piece of wood to go through the saw. Just a little dab of glue. And I'll slip it under the hand, position it, and let that dry. Now I'll just spin the propeller on and then secure it with a washer and a nut. I've mixed up another small batch of epoxy here to secure the rod on which the whirly gig will pivot. The rod is just a piece of 3 8 inch diameter solid steel. The last bit of hardware for our whirly gig is this piece of pipe. I couldn't find a single piece long enough, so I simply coupled a couple short pieces together. I drill a 9 16 hole. Here I'm using a block of wood, but it could just as well be the top of a fence post. I slide a 3 8 inch washer over the shaft that we epoxied in and the whole assembly down inside the pipe. Now, once in a while, that'll have to be lubricated, but it allows the whirly gig to turn freely in the wind. Now let me show you how we're going to paint the whirly gig. In the end, we sent it out to be painted to a friend and local artist, John Coles. We gave him some primer and some exterior grade paint. He did the bottom in red. He did the saw table and the other horizontal surfaces in a machine gray. The propeller is black. And for the woodworker, he took black and white paint and copied the image that's on our logo. The back of the woodworker is just simply black. Now let's turn on some wind and see how it works. Pretty good. Now all I got to do is find a good spot outdoors to show it off and a place where it's going to catch plenty of wind. Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. Today we're going to take some more of our ancient recycled pine timbers and build an old pine bar. Now we found the 